So we're going to talk about states and transitions next. So state machines are built into the language. Every item has a concept of a state. And it also has a variable that's an array called states. So each item can have its own state machine. And it's a very simple state machine, meaning that there's no parallel states and no substates. It's just a simple list of states. And you can be in one of those states at any given time. Now, if you have a file that has five different items in it, each one of those items can have its own state machine configuration. So you can do multiple states that way. And you can specify transitions to happen when you change state. Um, like maybe the state for a button is, are we pressed or not? Maybe the state for your whole application is, am I on the settings screen, or am I on the home screen, or am I on some sub-application screen? Um, so you can define transitions. So if your user interface or your device maps very well to a state machine, then you're going to be very happy with QML, because you can use the QML state machine framework to basically treat your GUI as a state machine and write very short code to implement states. So there is a type of element called state. And state is going to contain a bunch of property, um, a bunch of property changes that get applied when you're in that state. So basically, it's all about when you enter a state, change some properties. So here we are making a simple uh, traffic light that only has stop and go. We'll forget the yellow for a minute here. And we have a red light, and we're going to have a green light, stop and go. And uh, whatever one is off becomes black. So we're just going to start off with this simple layout of two rectangles. And in the outer, in the outer rectangle, we're going to implement a little state machine that is going to have a stop state and a go state. When we are in the stop state, then we are going to take the stop light and we're going to make sure it's red. And we're going to take the go light and change its color to black. We then have a state called go. And the property changes we're going to execute when we're in the go state is the stop light color becomes black, and the go light's color becomes green. And the way that you can uh, set the state is to simply manipulate the state variable. So initially, we're going to say we're going to start in the stop state. And that's going to apply the property changes listed in the state stop. So there is a, a subtle difference here. There is the state variable that takes in a string. And there is the state za, with a plural, that holds the list of states. And this is basically initialization of an array, which is why it has the brackets at the top and bottom. So here we are using the mouse area on clicked. If we just click this, um, this object, we're going to flip its state. So here we're saying that if the, if the state is stop, then we're just going to switch it to go, otherwise set it to stop. So every time we click it, we're going to change state, and these property changes get executed. So the property change object takes in a target and then a list of properties to change. So for any given target, you could change n amount of properties. So I could change the x, I could change the y, I could change a color, I could change a height, I can change um, anchors, all sorts of stuff. However, for each target, you need a separate property changes object. Um, and when you switch states, if I had something in the stop state that was not in the go state, then it would revert to how it was initially set in the QML. So it goes back to the initial state. It doesn't stay. Um, but normally, you have these things in, in lockstep. So there's an interesting thing you can do. Rather than setting the state variable, you can set a when clause 
in the state object to say that when the button is down, like do something. So for example, here we are saying that we have a state that's called with text. And its when clause is when this text state field is not empty. And when we, we have a state called without text, and it has a when clause to say when our text is equal to quote quote. Um, this, al this allows you to not have to directly manipulate the state variable and have JavaScript logic. Um, you could just bind it to one state. Do keep in mind that you cannot be in two states at any given time. So uh, Qt is going to complain if you set these when properties up and two of them happen at the same time. The, what's that? Runtime. Run so um, yeah, when you enter the state, it's going to complain. So the, um, the idea here is this is very good for uh, designing buttons because our down look is going to happen when the mouse area uh, mouse pressed. So anytime the mouse is down, we show our depressed look. So it's very easy to create a button using the state machine from QML. Do you have an and or statement here? Like the way the thing is or fail? Um, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Um, it's actually, it's, um, as long as it's a hunk of JavaScript that resolves to a Boolean, you're OK. So we have the ability to just simply make changes. We change the stoplight from black to red. However, users are expecting a more realistic environment. They want to see that stoplight not teleport from red to black. They want to see it fade, like the light's going out. So the, um, the red stoplight should fade to black, and the black go light should fade into green. And you can do this by specifying uh, transitions. So there is a states array, and there's a transitions array. <coughs> so transitions, you can um, tell it from any, from any state to any other state that you want to apply the property changes via animations not simply teleport their values. Um, if you do not specify a from and a to, then that transition applies to all state changes. So here, we are actually specifying uh, two transitions, one from the stop state to the go state. We are specifying one animation that the stoplight its property color is going to change over a duration of 1,000 milliseconds, AKA one second. That is going to cause the red to basically fade to black. And the property animation is very, very intelligent. It can handle colors. It can handle numbers. Um, it can handle coordinates. Um, it can handle most things in Qt. Um, and once again, if you want to have multiple targets, so you want to have both lights fade in and out, you would have to have a second property animation there. Um, and you can also nest these in parallel animations and sequential animations. So if you want to have things happen in a certain order or certain things animate at the same time, you can manipulate those by wrapping these in sequential and parallel animations. Yes. So in the background, yeah, the color's changing. If you ask it what the color is, uh, it's going to be from your state. So if the user's pounding on the keyboard while it's ready to transition, it'll go to the state. You know which state it's going to go to. Yeah. So if, you, if you're in the middle of a state change and the user changes the state to something else, then it's going to make the changes and start running those animations. So it is going to stop in the middle and go somewhere else.
Um, you can also use what, oh, yes. Reach your directions the animation. Yep. Um, you can also use wildcards. So you can say from any state to any other state. This also happens to be the default setting. So if you want star to star, you can just put nothing. Um, you just don't have a to and a from. Um, you can also have these transitions be reversible. So I could say that this transition from with text to without text um, is going to be this animation. And you know what? If we go in the other direction, just reverse it. Save you a lot of code right there. So some tips when using um, states and transitions. I uh, already mentioned this, but you can't do really complex things. So um, try to keep them simple. You should only be in one state at any given time. Don't try to do parallel states. You could do actually some different state things with um, um, having different state machines and different items, though. Um, you can set state with just code where you set the state variable. That's oftentimes very easy to do. Um, but think about, even after you write that, could I have just used a when clause? Um, and if you can use a when clause, then go ahead and use it. Um, and that's very good for like, is the button pressed or not? Oh, you mean do thing uh, like you? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can actually do a property animation, and there's um, there's an element you can put in there. I can't recall off the top of my head, but there's a script one where you can run a script along with your property animations. So when you change from the with text state to the without text state, you can call some JavaScript code, and that JavaScript code can call whatever it wants. I think, I think error handling was best left off to your application logic. However, you might have the little pop-up that shows up. That's definitely a state machine. Yeah. So basically, the tools at your disposal is the states array variable. You fill it with state objects. You have the state variable that takes in a string, which is the name. And you have a list of property changes that get run. And when it comes to transitions, you can specify transitions that happen between states. They can be reversible. Um, and you can specify wildcard values to say from any state to some other state do these property changes. And that could be you know, XY translations. It could be rotations. You can do some pretty complicated things pretty easily. And the uh, code for the transitions and animations is completely abstracted out from the final values, because those are just set in the property changes. So the lab uh, is going to be, or would have been, to make a light switch, uh, which would basically be like your you know, iPhone-style switch, where you could flick it back and forth. Um, and there's actually a, a number of solutions that you can do uh, using uh, just regular states, or you could have a reversible state. And we can go ahead and, uh, and look at the code for that. Yeah, that's not the right lab. Here we go. So basically, we're making this light switch. We click, 
and the light switch moves, and the indicator changes. And we'll notice it moves smoothly and evenly. You can imagine the user flicking this and watching it slide up the screen. And, uh, and we'll notice all of this happens in 52 raw lines of code, including all the white space. So this is where QML becomes really, really handy, is doing states, transitions, and these animations. So we have a rectangle for the, for the groove, the outside. We have a mouse area that basically is going to change the state to on or off. And we have a, the handle that's going to slide up and down. And then we have the indicator light, which is going to change color. So in our state for off, we say that in the off state, the handle is going to have an x coordinate of 30. And our light indicator is going to have a color of black. And in the on state, we are going to have the handle have a y of 90 and its color be red. And our initial state is set to off. Then in transitions, all we say is from off to on, it's reversible. We could have actually had nothing here. We could have had just property animation. And it would have worked, because that means from any state to any state. We basically say that we want to run a property animation on the property Y for the handle. And with that little amount of code, we basically have been able to move that switch evenly. Um, the property animations, uh, we're going to talk about them a little in depth when it comes to easing curves and things like that. Um, there's actually a lot of configuration that you can make for uh, the duration of the animation um, and the curve at which it takes. By default, it's linear. It moves smoothly and evenly. But maybe you want to have that be a, um, a quad in, a quad out, or a spring back animation where you flip the switch up and it goes a little over and bounces back and maybe has a little wobble at the end. Um, that's how you could make gauges that, like, you know, you want to change the value for your you know, fuel pressure from dead zero to 100 PSI, and you want to move that evenly and then have it bounce a little at the end to get the user's attention that the value has changed, rather than simply teleporting the needle, and then the user might not notice. So we're going to now talk about all those fancy animation properties that you can configure. Um, and um, pretty much most of the types of animations you're going to do is going to simply be just configuring what's available. There's about 30 easing curves that just come with Qt. So um, the standard set of animations is we've already seen the property animation, which can change almost anything. There are specializations of that called the number animation and the color animation and the rotation animation. And these have some specific properties in them to uh, determine how the color is going to change or how the number is going to change over time. There's also something called a vector 3D animation. Uh, that's only used for the, uh, I think it's in technology preview, the QML 3D package. But um, here's an example here of just making an, an, an animation. Animations don't need to be tied to states and transitions. You can just run them at any time. For example here, we have a rectangle, and it has a number animation on X which means that this number animation is going to apply to x and is going to go from the 0 coordinate to 150 coordinate over a duration of one second. And what this means is that when we execute this animation, it's going to move the item to 0. And it is going to move the item over one second to the coordinate 150. And then it's going to stop. So how do we run an animation? Well, by default, 
This does nothing. This is just setting up the animation. At any time, even when you first start the app, you could set running to true. And then it's going to execute that animation. So it's going to move um, the box directly to zero. And then it's going to slowly move it to 150. And when you set running, it will execute one loop of the animation and stop. Uh, if you want the um, animation to continue forever or for n periods, there is the loops variable. And you can use, set it to a number of loops or you can set it to infinite. And then it would run forever. So a uh, property animation is going to um, take a target, which is one particular item, and then a list of properties to animate. Um, it is going to take a from and a to and a duration. So here's an example of animating both the width and the height at the same time. So this, is, um, this particular property animation is going to grow rectangle 1 from very small to 100 over the course of 1,000 milliseconds. So when this first starts up, the width and height of the rectangle is 0, and it's going to grow over a second. So here is an example here of uh, we're basically using the uh, number animation rather than property animation. And we're going to tell it to basically increment the x property from 0 to 150. Basically the same thing with number animation. So um, these animations get applied separately for every object. So um, if you want to manipulate two objects at the same time, you need to have multiple, say, number animations or property animations. If you want to have them happen in a particular order, then you're going to have to wrap those animations in sequential and parallel animation, which are container items that will run those animations either in sequentially or in parallel. So you could have it say, well, OK, I want that rectangle to first move and then grow. Or you could do it in parallel and say, I want while it's moving to also grow. Um, so there was also some um, automatic animations that you can have happen when values change. And this is also really powerful. So there's the concept of the behavior element. So right now, we have the ability to just execute animations um, from, a, from one value to another value. A behavior says, from wherever you started to whatever your new setting is, I want you to move smoothly and evenly. So here, um, we have a behavior on x. This means that whatever object this is in, any time that object's x changes, it is going to use a spring animation, which is actually one of those easing curves that's going to move a little bit past and bounce back. It has uh, spring and dampening. You might use this for a gauge that you wanted to fly up and bounce around. So what this says is any time the x property changes, I'll run this animation on the x property. Uh, hold on here. I need to open another one.
I don't seem to have one on me. All right, so we don't seem to have a um, one on the property on the um, behavior animation. Um, but basically, behavior is the concept of just tying a animation to a change of a property. This animation gets run any time that property changes. So for any property, uh, any animation, I, could, I should say, there is a easing curve that is applied. Uh, the standard one is the linear easing curve, and that's basically going to say from x1 to x2, we're just going to um, interoperate that over a linear fashion. So we're just going to move smoothly and evenly. Now, you could go out exponential and basically run um, evenly to get halfway and then start exponentially increasing your velocity so it moves slow and then fast. So that might be like for a light switch, or maybe you're having the user drag it, so you get to a certain point, and you've let go of it, and the switch just flies up, because it's on a spring. And there's actually about um, 30 of these um, easing curves that are predefined by QML. And um, you can um, see them in documentation. You can see them in the examples. And you can see them in, say, like here is the easing curve that it goes slowly and then fast, sort of jerks its way in. So animation groups, there is only really two of them right now. There's sequential and parallel animations. But you can nest these as deep as you want. So you might say that you know, I want to first have the item move, and then we're going to have it zoom in. And then I'm going to have maybe it move again. And you could have it say, while it's moving, I also want it to be you know, uh, translating. So here, for example, is we have the rocket ship. And we have a sequential animation. So first, the rocket ship is going to scale to half of its size. And after that second has gone by, then the rocket ship's opacity is going to fade out. So first we're diving down, and then over the next second, we're going to fade out. And likewise, just like any animation, you can set its running variable to execute that animation. Um, sequential and parallel animations could also be applied to transitions, where they will be executed on transition changes which is probably the most common way of using them. So you can also specify a pause animation, which is only really useful inside of groups. So here we're saying, rocket, we're going to scale you over a second. We're going to wait a second, do nothing, and then go ahead and um, scale the rocket ship uh, back from uh, 1 to 0. So it's basically going to make the rocket ship go in and out. And since it doesn't have the loops variable set, it's only going to do it once. So parallel animation works the exact same way, except it executes the animations at the exact same time. And there's uh, varying animations you can use. There's a color animation, rotation. There's one for uh, animating anchors. So if you were using anchor layouts and you anchored something to the top left of the screen, now you want to anchor it to the top right, you can use an anchor animation to animate the move from the anchor top right to the anchor bottom right. There was also the, um, this is what I was looking for, the script action element will allow you to run scripts along with your animation. So maybe for every tick of your animation, you want to run some script. So 
So color animation is really smart. It can interoperate between two colors on the color chart. And rotation animation has a special property in it because it's really a number animation. It rotates degrees, except you can say clockwise, counterclockwise, or the shortest distance to move to actually get to the value you want. So for a lot of uh, rotational things, you could just use a property animation and it'll work fine. If you want to fine tune it, use the rotation animation. So here's an example here of using the rotation animation's um, um, shortest direction. So it's going to go from 45 to 315. The shortest way is to go backwards through zero to 315. Um, now, granted, you could have you could have set up this animation because it only runs once and it's pretty specific about where to move. Um, this usually comes in handy when you have something like a behavior, where you just want to change when a value change. You don't know where you're starting from or where you're going to end up. Any questions on the types of animations you can do? Yes? Let's say so you do a parallel uh, animation. Do you start an animation halfway through another animation? Like if you want to throw and then uh, fade, or shrink and then fade? Yeah, you can actually. Halfway through. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that is going to be a. Um, yeah, how do you start one halfway through? It's really a combination of, of sequential and, and parallel. Because the idea is, is that if you want to, um, you, can have, you can have them have different durations all right, when you're doing them in parallel. So you could have it, um, um, so it's, it's easy to have one continue after the other one has stopped. Um, to get one to go halfway through, I would just split it up into two different animations and say that we're going to move the, the x you know, 50. And then in parallel, we're going to move the x another 50 while we move y down 50. So then it would go in a you know, bracket shaped. Oh, yeah. You can go um, in parallel and sequential animations. You can go as deep as you want to go. Yes. And then more sequentials in those parallels. Yeah. That's, that's another solution. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, your sequential could be uh, the, the whole one and then a pause and a yeah, half. That would work too. Yes? Yeah, well, they're not going to take a lot of memory, because all of this is is simple manipulation of the coordinates of objects that are allocated in C++. What's going to take a long time is actually drawing it at 30 frames a second, or 60 frames a second, depending on how your screen is set up. So um, it, performs, it, it performs well um, on embedded devices on the desktop. Um, if you have OpenGL acceleration, it works even better. So if you have like an ARM with uh, Power, v, uh, Power VR acceleration um, or something like that, it works well. One thing you're going to end up noticing in QML1 is that you can get a little bit of tearing. Uh, because in reality, you want to have the uh, frame buffer update um, happen at exactly the vertical refresh of the screen. So you don't want to be, drawn, be writing into the graphics buffer memory and basically get half of one frame and half of another frame. You'll get a thing called ripping. Um, so on reasonably fast systems, uh, ripping isn't terrible with QML1. Uh, ripping is going to completely go away with QML2. When they move to the scene graph and everything's going to be OpenGL based, uh, they're going to use basically the graphics card to guarantee that the updates only Updates to graphics memory only happen basically between uh, vertical refreshes of the actual screen. But the performance is good. 
Um, when it comes to performance, um, like I tell my customers that if they have um, an embedded device with OpenGL, the world's theirs. You can do whatever you want. If you're on the desktop and have desktop style hardware or even like in one of these dual core atoms, do whatever you like. If you have a, uh, say, like a 400 or 600 me uh, megahertz ARM with just frame buffer, then you can use QML. But I wouldn't try to do a lot of animations. Because if you're trying to update the entire screen at 30 frames a second, you're going to draw down a lot of processor just drawing the screen. Even though the animations are only incrementing numbers, the real uh, processor intensive thing is actually drawing to the screen. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, you got to keep an eye on the hardware that you're targeting. So we're going to take a um, step down, and we're going to get back into some more code code. And we're going to talk about how to arrange items in something like a grid or a row, how to use data models to populate your screens, whether it's in a list or you just want a number of items based on a data model. And we're going to talk about things like list views and flickables and models and things like that. So we're going to talk about positioners and repeaters. I want a grid of elements. I want a row of elements. We're going to talk about um, models, pure models, visual models, and XML models. You can actually take a hunk of XML, run XPath queries on it, and create a data model, which is very useful if you are talking to a web service or have files that are XML based. And we're going to talk about how to use those models in your code, whether it's just using items or actually uh, list views. So first, let's talk about um, these positioners. There is a column, a row, a grid, and a flow object. So uh, some people might ask, what's the difference between a uh, flow layout and a column la and a uh, grid layout? Well, a flow layout is something where it is going to try to position as many rows as it can, I mean, as many columns as it can. So if it gets three items over and runs out of space, it'll simply make a new row, three items, new row. If you resize the screen, then the flow arrangement is going to say, oh, we have more space. I'm going to relay this out so I have one, two, three, four, five items. Next row, one, two, three, four, five. As opposed to the grid is more rigid. The grid has a fixed number of uh, columns to begin with. It's not going to try to auto rearrange the items. So repeaters are kind of like a template for creating objects that live in these positioners. So here's an example of making a grid with four rectangles. So we basically say grid, you're going to have two rows and two columns. This is the rigid version. And we're going to make four rectangles, just in line. And all the children of the grid are going to be ordered um, from creation from left to right. And the items are going to appear, and their properties are set as such. And the x and y provided on the grid is actually moving the coordinates of the grid. The items are going to be laid out by the grid. So instead of having four rectangles, or even worse, we wanted 25 rectangles, that would get rather obnoxious. So what we can do is we can have this thing called a repeater that is going to create items for us. And it's going to basically create the same, roughly the same type of item over and over again. So for example here, we're going to go ahead and make ourselves 24 rectangles. So we say we want a grid with five rows and five columns. We set the spacing in between the items to be 10. And we say, repeater, just go ahead and make 24 of these. And we're using this model variable. This model variable can take two different things. It can take in a static number, like 24, or it can take in a real data model, 
which we'll talk about in a few slides. So the simplest way is I want 24 of these things and just stamp them out, width and height of 70, color of light green. So the question is, what happens when I want these items to be subtly different? They're all going to be rectangles, but they're going to have slightly different configurations, such as I'm going to add a text item in there, and depending on the index that we got created in, we're going to have our number, or basically our creation number, um, displayed. So here we added a text item here called index. And we said, you know, uh, the anchors work as normal, so we're just going to center ourselves in our parents. And the repeater provides this index uh, variable here. We're going to notice when we deal with models and views that we're going to be given basically uh, magic variables from the data model, one of which is our index, which is available here in the repeater. So anytime you're executing inside a repeater, you have access to the variable called index. And you can use it to configure yourself slightly differently. We're going to find out when we talk about real data models that you're going to have the magic variables that are the names of your roles from the data model. So the, um, you can specify anchors inside of row columns or grids, and they apply to the same to all the items. So if you want to say center in, they'll all be centered. So the lab here was going to be to create a chessboard where you could actually move your chess piece around and keep track of what, um, of what indexes have been already visited. Um, this is actually a fairly difficult lab, but I'm going to show you how making a chessboard and making a little game becomes a lot easier when using the grid and the repeater. Out of the simulator. So here's our chessboard. And basically, this is the uh, combination of a repeater that's going to create the board and, well, the horse variable. So let's go ahead and take a look at what creates this. So the main QML file, this is something where we're making our own items. We haven't actually done this yet. But anything in its own file becomes its own item. So we have a board QML and a knight QML. So because we have a board QML, we now have this board element. And we have this knight element. And anytime our, uh, our board has been clicked, we're going to go ahead and move the knight. Because the knight has a function called move to. So let's take a look at the contents of the board. So for making such a large board, it's a pretty small amount of code. Basically, we come down to repeaters. And our model is actually a hunk of JavaScript that is going to return an array. So the model can either be a static set of numbers, it can be a real Q abstract item model, or it can simply be an array of items. So here we're basically just making a, um, a, an array of, um, of false, which means we have not visited the square. And inside of that repeater, we're just going to make n number of rectangles um, that is going to be gray or white depending on our repeater's model for a given index, 
our model is full of Booleans. So this is actually a very complicated hunk of JavaScript that's going to set our color based on to whether or not the knight has visited the board. And we'll notice here that it's actually doing valid chess logic. Let's move the knight around. And as we visit squares, it's going to color them in gray. That's because this little hunk of code here is basically looking into the model and saying, hey, model, are we true or false? And it's going to decide what color we're going to be for visited and unvisited. And our knight is basically simply an image with a source. And it has this move to function that takes in two variables, the board and the square to move to. And basically, this hunk of logic is going to determine whether it is a valid knight move. And it's actually, if it's a valid knight move, it's actually going to set our CX and CY, which are custom properties. And we use those custom properties to set our actual X and Y. So the, um, the X would be you know, row one, you know, column A, uh, or column three. And that will actually get us X, Y coordinates to actually move the, um, to move the knight to. Uh, well, the, yeah, and there's a bit of an overlap between them as well. So custom properties are, are properties on a particular item, and they get the automatic signals and can be used in bindings. Um, a JavaScript variable can either be local or it can be global to a JavaScript file. And in that case, like, we, we couldn't actually do like a global variable up here like var foo. But we could make a property int foo here, and it would have, for this file, it would actually be um, available because we can use the knight.foo to get access to it. If we imported a hunk of JavaScript uh, with imports, you know, my.js as my.js, um, then we could actually execute functions in here, um, like move it, x comma y. And inside the contents of my.js, we could have JavaScript variables, and they you know, would be, could be globals that could be changed between runtimes and stored between runtimes of move it. Um, but there's no. Um, so if you're in the QML land and you want storage, you need to use a property. If you're in JavaScript land and you want storage, use a JavaScript variable. Okay. Um, and sometimes they can be a little equivalent, too, um, because you could pass your, you know, if you had a property CY and you pass that in the JavaScript land, it could change CY as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yep. Oh, how does it figure out this color? Um, uh, when the mo when the model changes, this model when this. Uh, 
Yeah, what you couldn't do is this. You can't do that. You can, do, you can put it in line, but uh, it's not smart enough to dig into the my JavaScript color function to see all the variables it's using. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're using n variables here, and in any one of the variables changes, this gets re-expressed. Um, Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's right here. So um, in JavaScript, um, arrays are. Um, when you access their items, you're not accessing references, you're accessing copies. So here is an example where we're making a copy um, of the model. Uh, we are manipulating uh, the items in that model, and then we're setting it back on the board model. No, just the one that changed, which you can see here. Like, there's no for loop here. It's not recreating I mean, it. Uh, in the board, back in board, yes. does it run through all 64 of that JavaScript that you have? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, hold on. Let's see. Let's take a look at that binding for a second. Yeah, it's going to rerun all the squares. Because the whole model is changing. You could. You could actually place two items down, one invisible, and make it visible when you visited it. Um, yeah, I'm sure, there's, I'm sure there's n number of ways to make these examples better. And also, Qt Creator comes with the JavaScript profiler. So you could run this 100 times and see what your profiler told, you know, says with blockage. Yes? Yep. Yeah. Uh, we see, we, ha we haven't gotten to that yet. Okay. So there's a, there's a certain bit of magic that goes on, is that in the same, if you're in the same directory as your QML file, everything's relative to you. If you have other files in your directory, they just magically become items. We'll talk about that when we get back from snack time, which is right now. So there's uh, snacks and drinks out in the lobby. I think it's a 15 minute break. Half hour break, great. Everyone can get their uh, coffee and cookies.